So the popular uh, puzzle toy, the Rubik's Cube, can have many mathematical concepts applied to it, specifically for our purposes here today, concepts from group theory. Now we all know that the ultimate goal of the Rubik's Cube is to move each of the three by three by one sections of the cube such that each of the six sides of the cube are monochromatic, they're all the same color. But you might say, how does group theory specifically apply to the Rubik's Cube? Well, if we define our group to be the collection of all such movements of the three by three by one sections of the cube, and we define a binary operation, we'll call it star, such that when we take two elements of the Rubik's Cube group, arbitrary elements, we'll call them G1 and G2, that when we combine them with the binary operation star, star means to perform G1 and then immediately followed perform G2. So now that we've defined our group and we have defined a binary operation on the group, we, well, we must make sure that the properties of the algebraic structure of a group hold. And those uh, well-known properties are closure, associativity, the existence of inverses for all elements of the group, and the existence of an identity element. So to begin, we'll start with closure. And closure means that when we combine any two elements um, from the group, the Rubik's Cube group, we get, uh, we, it yields a member of that group as well. And that is true. For any two elements we take from the Rubik's Cube group, any two arbitrary elements, we'll call them G1, G2, uh, we will get um, another member of the Rubik's Cube group. Now, as far as associativity, we'll go down here and then we'll see that this sta uh, statement holds. When we take three elements, we'll say three elements from the Rubik's Cube group, G1, G2, and G3, and when we rearrange the parentheses, meaning that we perform G1 star G2 first, followed by that result with G3, and then when we go over here, we perform G2 uh, star G3 first and combine that uh, following with G1, that they are equivalent. It's hard to um, do that, uh, like, uh, see that with an actual cube, but just um, believe me when I say that that statement is true. Now, as far as inverses, we'll go to this middle middle line here, and then uh, which says that for every element, you know, this could be an arbitrary element, G1 star with its inverse yields an identity element. So this is a little easier to see with an actual Rubik's cube. So if we uh, perform uh, an arbitrary operation, we'll say this one. There is a move that, uh, when combined with it, star this move I'm about to do will yield the identity element, and that move is this one. So once again, the, uh, the arbitrary move combined with its arbitrary inverse is this, star its inverse. And as uh, we know from um, the properties of inverses when applied um, to the element that they are in the inverse of, it is they yield uh, the identity element, which goes to our last property of groups, the existence of an identity element. Um, for this group, I like to think of it as E. And E is, uh, as we just saw with the inverse thing here, this move combined with this move, I like to think as, of E as the empty move, or the move in which we do nothing. And that is, um, and that exists for all um, elements and their inverses. It will yield the do-nothing move, the empty move. So now that we have defined a group and we have uh, confirmed all of its uh, group properties, um, we have to um, well, further explore the properties of this group and think, can it be uh, part of something more elaborate, such as maybe a ring? And uh, the short answer to that is no. The, uh, the group I have outlined here, the Rubik's Cube group I have outlined, cannot be expanded into something um, more elaborate such as a ring. And that is, to elaborate further on that, the reason for that is it is not abelian. And what I mean by that is that the, um, the elements of this group do not commute. So, for instance, when I do this and this, it is not the same as doing the second move I did first and followed by the first mood move I did. So that means that the elements of the group do not commute, so it is not um, abelian. 
which means um, it cannot be a ring because uh, being a, in a, a commutative group is a, um, a property of a ring. So it cannot be uh, expanded further into something uh, greater. And uh, to conclude, um, I'd like to elaborate on a couple of open questions that, some interesting open questions that can be applied to this group. Um, the first one, the first of the two, is what is the minimum number of moves from an arbitrary position of the cube? This is an arbitrary jumbled position of the cube. So when I, when I have this position, what is the minimum number of moves uh, to get back to the solved state? The solved state is, of course, the state in, state in which all the sides are monochromatic, not seen here. Once again, this is a, a jumbled state of the cube. So what is the minimum number? That'll, be, that'll change for you know, every jumbling of the cube. Um, that number for this position will be different than, let's say, for, for this one. Uh, the second of these two questions, uh, the second, uh, which I find even more interesting, uh, can be phrased as, what is the maximum number of optimized moves needed to get back to the solved state of the cube? Now, that's kind of a, you know, a weird uh, phrase sentence there, but it can also be phrased as, what is the worst possible jumbling of the cube? Um, both these questions, I believe, are still open. The second one, I, uh, I mean, the first one is uh, sometimes referred to as God's algorithm, and that's because uh, you know an omniscient, all-knowing being would optimize any collection of moves, and um, the number, that minimum number that I talked about, is sometimes um, referred to as God's number, and I think it's around twenty or something. But I believe these are both still open questions, and. Um, both open interesting questions that are that relate to the Rubik's Cube group that I have defined here today so thank you for listening